My name is Sam Jenks, and welcome to another episode of The Way We Source, a podcast hosted by Kodiak Hub, where we share our talks with procurement practitioners, leaders, expert consultants, content gurus, and people that we find downright inspiring. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Executive VP Procurement at Proxima, which was recently acquired by Bain & Company, keynote speaker, advisor to CPOs, author, thinker, and a person that I very much would like to share a beer with one day, Simon Giel. Simon, welcome to the show. Did I did I butcher your last Morning. name? You're, I see you laughing. Yeah, you butchered my last <laughs> name. This is this is like the second time we've done this. And um, you know, you say all those nice things, and then you get my name wrong at the end. Oh, I'm so sorry, si- Simon. Giel. I mean, I don't mind. It, it, That's the one. There we are. Hello. I have to start with a question that we ask a lot of our our, our guests that we have on. What exactly does procurement and sourcing mean to you, Simon? Um, oh my goodness. Um, right. Uh, it's a job <laughs> profession. Um, it's kept me employed. Um, no, so what it look, it's enabled me. So I started out in sourcing and procurement. It was the first thing I did as a sort of grown up job. And, um, look, it's enabled me to do different things, test myself, learn, grow. I've worked with brilliant companies, wonderful people, made some friendships that will last forever. So I have a very sort of personal view Mm. on it because after almost two decades it's probably shaped me a little bit more than i care to care to let on and hopefully vice versa vice versa um but i think uh besides i mean i think i've got a passion for learning i've got a passion for for change for delivering stuff for camaraderie challenge and i've found it all in sourcing and procurement i think and now more so than ever so for me it's like you know it's the canvas for a a really great, fun career. Fantastic. I, I think this is an interesting uh, thing that we've talked about with a few of our guests, David Latin uh, from Logitech, as well as Kelly Barner, uh, an expert uh, and also a, a, a definitely a content guru in the space, you know, about whether whether they choose or, or procurement chooses you, right? Um, I, I'm curious, what, what, why have you chosen the field of procurement? Or is it so that procurement chose you? Well, uh, uh, growing up, I wanted to be um, an actor, a journalist, <laughs> a DJ, or uh, a PE teacher. Okay. Um, and um, I, I always sort of thought that one day I'd wake up and know what I wanted to do, but that still hasn't happened. Mm. Um, and so um, I sort of love that, but I sort of also envy those who had a calling um, a little bit. So I did sort of fall into it. Yeah. I mean, not not entirely by accident. I can't I can't sort of um, say that. You know, I. I I went and did a, uh, a master's course in procurement okay. and therefore, even though I wasn't quite sure what procurement was when I applied for that <laughs> master's yeah. course, um, the inevitable outcome was that that's, that's what I went into. But I stayed in it because of all those reasons, really. Um, and aside from a few blips, which are largely down to my personal motivations, um, that ability to have variety, make an impact, yeah. do interesting work, meet interesting people, um, it's never gone away. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, procurement is an exciting, is, is standing in front of a very exciting time uh, currently and has been for the last few years, not only with digitalization that's ongoing, but also with the various challenges that they face as a, as a role, right? Because change has been, mm. has been one of the, the main things that's been constant during the past few years. And I know that you, in your role, you're often brought in as a, you know, an advisor to CPOs, uh, somebody that's brought into contexts where, you know, the customer is facing a rather big challenge within the procurement organization. Uh, you know, you don't get brought in for the easy times, right? You get brought in for the challenging times, I assume. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, with this knowledge at hand, what would you say is kind of the biggest challenge that procurement is facing today? Goodness, Sam, which one's uh, pick a favorite child? <laughs> We're in that sort of territory now. Um, yeah, we all know we've got one. Um, they're not listening. No, they're not it's listening. Okay. Tr- trust school. me, th- th- this is the um, last podcast that your kids are listening to, so don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because what, what you do day to day generally informs your sort of opinion bias on that sort of thing. And you're right. In consulting, we're usually there to provide either capacity or capability or both mm. often around sort of a big, um, yeah, big hairy problem, big hairy goal, opportunity, whatever. Um, and, and I actually do presentations on this where I, I go and talk to people about here's the challenges that other CPOs are facing. Right. And it probably wouldn't surprise you that there's about eight things on that mm. wheel. Um, and I think 
you can sort of, it's a bit of a cop out, but you can sort of say that the biggest challenge they're facing at the moment is that they've got to deal with everything everywhere all at once. Um, mm. And I, I talk about it like it's a vice. So if you imagine you've got um, sort of a vice crossed with a pie chart, if you can imagine that. So you've got all these segments which are closing in on you at, 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 at different degrees. And you think that in those segments, you've got things like value chain transparency, you've got planning, you've got talent, you've got experiential, mm. um, all these sorts of things. And, and, and they're squeezing CPOs or businesses or CPOs to a different degree. So, so, so the experience is not really uniform. Um, and the biggest challenge is how to, how to face into that, how to lead your team into mm. that. Because um, the worst possible outcome is, is inertia, saying it's someone else's problem, I'll wait, um, or not being sufficiently motivated to take the opportunity and lead your team into it. So I think, you know, in times of adversity, the biggest challenge can be, you know, just how to plow on. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, uh, how do you think your teams need to plow on? What, what is what is one of the ways that they can get there, so to say? Um, well, I I actually think uh, um, we're probably living in times where you can't do everything mm. everywhere all at once right. unless you have um, unlimited budget. And so I think you know, one of the challenges which often faces procurement teams is that they've 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 tried to do everything everywhere or they've wow. you know they've divided up spend and said well we're going to focus on this bit i think really you know, the, the key to um an, uh, an an effective and a valued and a loved procurement team is that they they do the things that the business is really asking mm. them to do so i think focusing in on you know what's the current business objectives you know what's the business really trying to achieve right now right and focusing in on that, that's where you make the, the most difference. Well, I think that a lot of procurement teams during the last few years, right, they're looking to, for the buy-in from the rest of the business and obviously becoming really that support function to drive, whether it's savings or top-line value for the business is, is, is a great is a great opportunity to be able to get that buy-in. But I mean, do you have any additional practical tips other than kind of focusing in on what the business needs um, for procurement teams, maybe to, 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 to find themselves in more of that value-driving position? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, um, so, I mean, you've got to get yourself into, this is probably one of my favorite topics because I think you've got to get yourself into that, into that position, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. the, the business is not just going to, um, you know, what you're essentially asking people to do when you're in procurement is look, trust me, I'm going to help you to get a better outcome than you can get yourself. Right. And that's a pretty big ask, right? So how do you build that trust? How do you, um, make the case that convinces someone to act that convinces them to, to trust you? Um, and I, you know, I think that, um, well, I'll come to, to, to my sort of passion on this in, for, in a second, but there's a thing called the trust equation, which is probably the most consulting thing I'll say today. <laughs> but um, the trust equation is essentially, it's credibility, reliability, intimacy over self-orientation. So broadly, it's about, are you credible? Are you reliable? Are you there? Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, are you sort of authentic or, or, or nice to deal with? And that sort of equals trust. And that sort of gets gets built up over time. So I think you know, thinking about how you can build trust, that's what really unlocks unlocks your ability to go and play in the spaces where you're not today. Mm. Um, but but the two sort of elements that I'm quite passionate about when I when I delve into that concept usually is number one is customer centricity, um, and number two is storytelling. Mm. So so what do I mean by customer centricity? I don't, I don't mean just sort of you know being close to your customer. I mean you know walking in their shoes, understanding them, understanding right. what keeps them up at night. I believe that if you walk into a room and ask your customer, you know, hi, I'm procurement, what can I do for you? You will always be constrained by their view on what you can do for them. Mm. Whereas if you understand them and what they're trying to achieve and the things that they think perhaps you can't help with, then you can start to surprise them. You can un start to unlock um, new levels of trust and new levels of influence. So I think that's one thing. Right. And then I think the second thing is really about storytelling. And your ability to go and tell great stories, tell the stories that inspire change. And I think, you know, there's a lot of neurological research out there that sort of suggests that, you know, decisions decisions are made on um, emotion rather than logic. Right. So I think you've got to think about, you know, what's the purpose of my story? Who am I telling it to? How am I going to tell it? And, you know, how am I going to be when I when I do it? And, you know, telling great stories can move people to, you know, take risks, 
do different right. things, ultimately act. Well, emotion plays a big role. That's why you're on this podcast. You weren't thinking with your head. You were thinking with uh, your emotions, uh, Simon. You signed up, uh, you signed up uh, unwillingly, it feels like. <laughs> oh, I'm joking. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I mean, obviously that's, that's something I've got to live with <laughs> and, uh, and, and have done for the, the two times that we've now recorded. No, this. exactly. So yeah. uh, <laughs> for, for those out there listening, unfortunately, uh, Simon's first go around, uh, did not record. So we're, we're, we're doing take number two here and, and, and it feels already better at, at, at this point in time. So I'm happy with it, Simon. No worries. Let's get into Good. let's get into the transformation bit a bit because I think that you mentioned some interesting things there. You know, storytelling as well as then a trust to the business. You know, two elements that I think a lot of you know procurement leaders of today's modern uh, you know kind of procurement team are focused on building more of a vision for procurement, right? Um, but I mean, the fact is is that the the role needs to change from just being kind of a support function that's helping people to buy, negotiate, and and cut costs. How how do you think that this is going to 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 happen in the future? I mean, how does this procurement continue to future proof itself? Um, do you know, I I often have a sort of um um a sort of hypothetical intellectual debate with myself about the term future proof and, and whether I believe in it or not. Because I think I think the um I suppose our future in a way will be will will be defined by what we do now and you know our businesses. Uh, the, the amount of trust that we can we can um you know build within businesses around being able to help mm. them with these big hairy problems that they're facing so i think there's probably a level set there um but i actually think that you know leading a procurement function today is about evolving that procurement function mm. so it's about e- even if the steps are small it is about having a you know a big vision of you know where you think it's going to go and something that um, particularly in times where talent is is scarce, yeah. um, that people can get behind and 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 be a part of. I think that's really important. But ultimately, you know, future proofing is probably about relevancy. Right. Mm. And to be relevant, you have to tie procurement into what the business is trying to achieve. So it can't be harder or worse or less enjoyable than somebody doing it themselves. It can't hold them back. Of course, that means new tech, new skill sets, et cetera. But fundamentally, I think it means that the services are relevant. Um, and it means that the way you provide the service is relevant. Mm. And therefore, you know, the people that you need and, you know, the diverse mix of, of, of skills right. and opinions and all of that sort of mm. follows. Um, but, but probably, or if you, if you, I mean, really just thinking this through, I think two other things leap out. Number one um, is that, you need your CPO um, to lead. Right. So the CPO has got to be effective. And I had a colleague once, I, no, I'm going to get this wrong. Um, I had a colleague once uh, who, who left us recently, actually. And he always used to say, and I, I think this is probably quite divisive, but it is a perspective. He used to say, the three things that make a super effective CPO is their ability to create the vision, their ability to play the politics, and their ability to get money. Mm. And I thought that was really interesting, right? Because not a lot of people say yeah. that. That's about their ability to drive change. Mm. And then the other thing which I find really important personally, and I, I try and encourage, is that I think it's really important to create a safe space where your team are prepared to come in and try and evolve and do new things and push things forward mm. um, and not afraid to sort of fail or be knocked back or you know that you're receptive to ideas. Because I think that creates a culture and a mindset where people do want to push things forward. Yeah. And it's so interesting and, and important. I think that you're focusing in on the, the aspects that are the softer elements of, of what procurement has to offer, right? Because I think that we're also focused on the hard skills, uh, getting down to the numbers, how much can we slash, right? So I think that's important aspects that you, that you focus on. And, and I think that the teams of tomorrow, you know, are, are, are kind of shifting, uh, within their tech, within their processes, within the talent that they're they're bringing on, and I think that you know transformation is uh, as as you like to say the big hairy uh, a big hairy word, <laughs> if I can use some of your terminology. Um, but I mean the fact is, is transformation is ongoing, right? Um, w- w- what do you think some companies are getting right? And also, what are they getting wrong when it comes to transformation within procurement? Do you have any kind of things that are glaring that you see uh, as as a trend in the market? Well, I think I think you summed some of it up in that question there, and the and the, the, the sort of the the way you phrased the point there around the soft things. Mm. 
and the soft skills. Mm. Um, if I was to say, well, what do I think people are getting wrong? Well, I think probably not um, uh, solving what they want to solve rather than what's good for the business. Mm. Mm. You know, transforming into something which is perhaps, you know, irrelevant for the people that you serve or you know, not focusing on something that, that solves a problem. I think insufficient focus on the case of change or change management. Um, I think making it, you know, making it look big and then delivering small mm. or not, not dreaming big enough. All those things I think can, can set you off on a, on a, on a rocky road. But, um, in about 2019, there was this incredible paper that was written on digital. Okay. Um, Absolutely. I know it was incredible because I, I wrote it. Um, and <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's like it's instantly but, forgettable. But, but, but what um, is this paper called um, if people want to try and find it? Uh, oh, Sam. I can't remember. How about the, let, we'll link it, we'll in link it into the, the, We'll um, link it into the notes. We'll share, share, it, share it with me after that episode. Yeah. We'll link it into the notes for sure. But, but essentially what it was, was it was, a, um, it was a digital questionnaire, you know, because we love to do questionnaires. And um, uh, we asked some questions around transformation in particular with a digital slant and this one thing that i always quote or two stats i always quote the first one was that about 30 30 to 40 percent i think it was about 33 percent or something like that of the people we surveyed expected their transformations to be judged a failure before they'd even started can you say that again which i thought 30 percent of the of the of the surveyed yeah. group which was a, a group of procurement leaders expected that the transformations they they were about to embark on would be deemed a failure before they'd even started. And, and it's not because I wasn't listening. I just think it's important for that for, for the listeners to hear that. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's a well, feeling I, of I, negativity I, in the business. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's getting off on the on the wrong foot massively, right? And then the second one was that um, about half, uh, probably a little under half, yeah. um, said that their biggest barrier was their ability to sell the case up front. Mm to the people who had the purse strings. Right. And I thought that was really interesting, right? So where does transformation go wrong? Well, maybe before you even start. Um, now, what are they getting right? Uh, well, I think it's probably two sides of the same coin. I mean, if, you, if we take that digital space and you look at people like, um, uh, who I'm big fans of, people like Sam DeFreitas at Mars and Adam Brown, now at Maersk, formerly at BT, BT yeah. um, they, they kind of know why they're doing it. They're doing it to make the business better. There's a purpose. There's simplification in their narrative. It's understandable right. and it's delivering. Right. But I think that that's important. I mean, uh, there, there's a lot, of, there's a lot that you've unpacked there and, and some really great tips, I think for anyone that's listening, that is a procurement leader or, or, or stepping into or looking to step into a procurement a leader role. And I think that one of the things that you also mentioned about was the fact that, you know, transformation encapsulates digital, right? Technology is, is, mm, is, is continuing to, to grow within the space and not to get to, into too much of a digital procurement conversation here, because you know there, there's a lot of there's a, a lot of talk about it uh, in various contexts. So I don't want to just fa focus on that. But what do you, what do you think are some of the big, maybe not trends, but kind of things movers, so to say, things you see happening in the next three to five years in procurement? Well, I think in the next three to five years, we'll all be holograms communicating <laughs> through, through, through we four already with are. Um, chips in our we head. We already are. Well, and then there's the chip shortage, maybe six maybe years. Maybe six years. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you're absolutely right, right? There's this sort of deafening noise around digital at yeah. the moment. And I'm a big fan of best of breed, but I, I do think that there's so much noise. Yeah. Well, you know, you, that, you and um, I saw each other at DPW, and I think somebody said it to me very good. They said... Uh, DPW, which is an awesome event, and if you don't, if you're not familiar with it, check it out. It's in Amsterdam every year. It's it's super good. Matthias Gutsman has done a fantastic job building up an awesome event with awesome speakers, awesome team there. Uh, it's 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 glossy, you know. It's a fantastic, fantastic event, and it's the who's who of ProcureTech. But, you know, that's that's the ten percent, right? If if not mm -hmm. even if if maybe even five percent, it's 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 us fanboys. It's us who love procurement technology, right? But where's where's the rest? You know, uh, they're they're sitting uh, they're, I, they're sitting in, in, in a totally different situation. I think you're absolutely right, and I think I mean I'm a massive fan of of DPW and, and Matthias as well. I think um, well, you know we talk a lot about disruptors in this space. The, the reality is that there's very few disruptive exactly. solutions out there. And you get there. to meet them. Very little and you get to meet them there and you get but to he, hear them there, well, right? But, but uh, He's delivered I, okay, absolutely. He's, he's delivered disruption. Absolutely. Um, well, I, you know, I reckon, so So let's not talk about ProcureTech. Let, let's talk about something else. So we're sitting in 
this is probably the second sort of consulting bullshit thing I'm going to tell you, but, <laughs> but it's absolutely true, right? So we're in the middle of the, the fourth industrial revolution. Mm. So Industry 4.0. Yep. We talk a lot about Industry 4.0. For people who don't know what Industry 4.0 is, give it a quick Google. It's basically the talking fridge or, you know, <laughs> um, you know technologies it's, like um, it's connectivity, it's connectivity. Right? It's 3D printing. And the, it's, the interconnectivity you know, of, of things and, 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 and technology, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. And if you, <clears throat> and, and what I really like about this is that um, because we're not inventors or not many of us are not inventors, you might be an inventor in your spare time. I don't, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you could be, um, but but um, you know, we're not, we're not inventors, so so we're not sat there going, oh, you know, what am I going to build out of the fourth industrial right. revolution? Someone else is going right. to do that. Um, but if you look back at the previous three industrial revolutions and you think about what came out of them, you can start to get an appreciation for the scale of change that we're facing into, mm. and that we're on the precipice mm. of, and that we're really probably, you know, things like um, uh, the first industrial revolution, steam, steam train. Uh, you know, the ability to industrialize clothing and building materials up and down the country. The second one, electricity, electrification, light bulbs, uh, airplanes. The, the third one, the internet, connectivity mm. in that mm. way. And now this. And anyone who's, who's about, um, about my age, so, so early 30s, um, <laughs> or, or mid 40s, um, we can remember what it's like to, or the changes that we've been through, through the last industrial revolution, right. through the, you know, the, the, the birth of the internet. And that sort of kind of see what it was like before that. And I just think it's really exciting that we're facing into this seismic change that many of us don't really know what it's going to be. But we kind of know that in our space, the outcome is going to be these sort of, well, the outcome is going to be based on the challenges that we're facing today. Mm. The answer to which is transparent and interconnected value-based ecosystems. And that's what we're going to move towards, in my opinion. That's as a personal opinion, it's, um, you know, but but I think that that's what the fourth industrial revolution is going to deliver in our space. Mm. And I mean, what do those ecosystems look like? I mean, if you if you could expand upon that, you know, for for, for the listener out yeah, there, so, I mean, okay, yeah. So I use the term value right. ecosystems very deliberately yeah. because I think um, we've gone through. Over the last two years, we've accelerated through this sort of concept of my suppliers, my supply chain, my value chain. Right. And the value chain is about joining up all the all the uh, sort of orchestrated parties from you know suppliers, sure. customers, internal operations, regulators, etc. It's, it's et holistic stakeholder value, huh? Absolutely, yeah. and that becomes that's the ecosystem in which a business yeah. lives. So it's employees, your own conscience, the regulator, hmm. the customer. And, and your ability to react to those things and create something that can operate and excel in those things will be based on how transparent and connected that ecosystem is. Mm. And that's what we'll work towards. But like any tech, um, and we see this at the moment with, with best of breed, which essentially lacks an experience layer and a data layer to, to pull it all together and make it all, all work um, super cohesively. You see that um, you know, the pioneers go and build something and then the settlers go and buy something. Mm. And um, you know, we, we sort of wait for those sort of utility solutions because whilst a lot of that tech is available today to make this sort of concept work, um, you know, it's reserved for the people who've got the, the, the amount of money that can go and build it, mm. which is very few. And the amount of um, power over their suppliers to get the data, which is very few. And so I think we're starting to see what's possible, but, but it's not yet necessarily practical. Hmm. It's a fantastic uh, way of putting it. How can we get to that practical place? Maybe that's that's uh, the last question that I have for you. <laughs> Not an easy one. Well, I think you're breaking up there, Sam. <laughs> yeah, I think you're breaking yeah, up. Exactly. Um, uh, there's um, well, I think um, you know, as consultants, as practitioners, mm. as um, you know, solution providers like yourselves, I think our our job uh, is to you know create that vision and sort of work towards it but you know, it sounds a bit glib but we'll get there when there's money to be made mm. in getting there and i you know i i spent a i spent a, a, a while trying to sell software i was very bad at it <laughs> um i'm, I'm yeah, very bad at selling in general which is why i don't do it but um my ceo said to me one day he said in, in software sales what you're looking for is the person who's got the problem 
knows they've got the problem, knows that they'll be fired if they don't solve the problem, and has the budget. Mm. And you know that that that's meaningful demand yeah. for a for a vendor to go and 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 if you can find lots of people like that, you know, like the challenges that we're facing into today around risk and scope three and blah, blah, blah. Suddenly all this meaningful demand is created that enables vendors and investment houses to plow money into yeah. it and say, you know what, we're going to solve these things. Mm-hmm. And when when the tidal wave comes and 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 the demand, you know, the demand side suddenly says, well, the next thing is that we want complete transparency over these ecosystems, over the value chain, whatever, whatever phraseology they use, they probably won't use that because it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, at the point where they they do that, I think that's the point where the investment goes in and the solution providers all rally behind it and, and the consultants, mm. et cetera. Because mm. um, as, as someone once said to me, the pioneers go in and run the hard yards and the settlers come in and make all the money. Yeah. I think it's a it's a great point and something maybe to to leave our listeners with. I, I I I'm super happy that you joined us. I'm super happy you acted upon a motion and and took the time to to be on our podcast, Simon. <laughs> it's a pleasure. And, Simon. and it's whether pleasure, you're you know. a good salesman of of software or not, you've 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 sold uh, yourself to all of our listeners. I'm sure. Uh, where can people get in touch with you if they're interested in doing so, Simon? Um. Just um, say my name three times and um, <laughs> rub, the, no. rub the bottle. Um, you'll, you'll pop yeah. up like a genie, huh? Yeah, the obvious one is um, is LinkedIn. Simon yeah. Geel. Um, if I say that, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, Simon Geel. Um, uh, um, I work for a company called Proxima. Um, so you can find me on LinkedIn. Do get in touch because I, I really enjoy meeting new people and, and getting new experiences and learning new things. So. Um, yeah, I'd love to, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd love to meet more people like that. Yeah. And I think that you, those that are out there that are looking to transform should definitely reach out. Uh, but you're not going to get off that easy yet, Simon, where we've then entered now into our, <laughs> our, our famous little, uh, part of the, uh, every episode where we, uh, do a segment that's kind of like a Kodak moment. You remember the famous, uh, uh, brand I of, of yeah, yeah, well, I do. they, they unfortunately, uh, dove pretty hard when, when digital came. Uh, but, uh, they yeah. had, they, they had, of course the Kodak moment, right. Where you were sharing a special moment together. And I'd like to spa- share a special moment here with you, uh, which is oh. really our, our, <laughs> our hot fire round. Uh, just, just, to, for the listeners to get to know you a little bit better as a person, Simon, that's, that's okay. what we're doing here. All right. So I'm curious, three quick questions, uh, and off the top of your head, short answers, if you are eating uh, dinner, you have the opportunity to eat dinner with somebody that is alive, anybody in the world, who is it? It would be my wife without my children. <laughs> <laughs> now we really hope that your children are listening to the episode. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I love my children, by the way. We'll, we'll clip out that sound bite. It's been a long so, time. We'll clip yeah, out that sound bite so you can be able to hand it over to your wife as well. So that's very nice. Okay. Thank you. That's on, very kind of you. On, on top of that, uh, if if you are heading on a on a on a vacation, all expenses paid, maybe you're going with your wife as well. Where are you guys heading? The best place I've ever been to that I enjoyed the most was probably Japan. Ah. Um, and I'd love to go back. And I went there on work. I'd love to go back and explore it a bit more. Very nice. Very nice. Um, what book are you reading or a book that you would suggest right now? Can't read, Sam. Honestly, <laughs> I, know, I don't mean that in a glib sort of way, like, oh, I can't read. I find it really hard to read okay. books. Um, a I've podcast or something you're listening to that you could suggest? Uh, I am... What am I... That's a good question. Um... <laughs> I've got no idea, Sam. I've got no idea. That's no worries. It, it, you, you, sometimes, sometimes I don't know is an acceptable answer, Simon. And that's exactly. Do you know, I, I say I can't read, but actually, I speed read three books on my last holiday. Is that right? So, I did. I was in Krakow, and I read um, the Tattooist of Auschwitz. Um, I read um, Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, and I read. Um, uh, Airhead by Emily Maitlis, who's a who's a news um, uh, what's called current affairs and news provider over in um, over in the UK here. So those are the last three things I read. There you go. Um, Buy one, I'd get three for free. Them. There, that's what we had. There Perfect. you go. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, Simon, it's been a pleasure having you on the episode today, and uh, I urge everybody that's looking to work towards transformation or looking just to have an interesting conversation to reach out to Simon Geel G E A L E. 
it's easy to mistake it for Giel, but Simon Giel on LinkedIn or alike. Thank you so much for being on today's episode, Simon. Thanks ever so much, Simon. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. Nice to see you again.